I came tonight so that none of you would be able to leave this auditorium and ever again be able to say to a physician, to a counselor, to your future husband or wife, nobody told me. I didn't know. If you have sex outside of a permanent marriage relationship, you will pay. There's a cost. No one has ever had sex outside of that context and not paid. And the question we got to ask tonight is this. What is the cost and is it worth it? I um, travel all over the United States and internationally speaking to about a quarter of a million teenagers a year, uh, every, every year, and uh, have learned a tremendous amount from the students that I've spoken to. Before I started speaking and traveling full time, I spent nine years counseling in crisis pregnancy centers in Chicago and in Minneapolis, St. Paul. And for nine years, I would have girls in my office every day saying, Pam, I didn't know. And if somebody would have told me that this was going to be the result of the choice I was making, I'd have made a different choice. No one told me. I began to ask these girls in my office, what could we have said? What could someone have said to you before you made your choice that might have helped you to have made a better choice? And after nine years, I realized that there were a lot of students out there making decisions about sex, having absolutely no idea what the consequence of that choice would be. It's going to talk about today. I want you to understand that I didn't come today to decide for you what you're going to do about sex. That is not why I'm here. I can't make this choice for you. Don't intend to. Can't go on your dates with you. I don't have time. Okay. I mean, I can't choose for you. No matter how much we would wish that we could put you in a box, lock it, feed you through a window till you're 24, we can't. All we can do is love you, tell you the truth, Hope you make good choices. My goal today isn't to decide for you what you're going to do. You can do whatever you want. My goal is that none of you would be able to leave here and ever again have to say to a physician, to a counselor, to your future husband or wife, nobody told me. I didn't know. Today you're going to be told what you choose to do when you walk out of here is up to you. I get to start today the way I can't typically start in public school settings, and that's why it's so wonderful to be in parochial schools and be able to start this way. Students, God created sex. It's awesome. It's not a terrible thing we can't talk about at Catholic school. God created sex. That's right. Now listen. Listen up. God wants you to have great sex. He does. This is not about wrecking your fun. Now listen, you guys laugh at that. And I am going to prove it to you by the end of this hour. So you have to pay very close attention. Because I'm going to have to talk to you about this again. God created sex. It was his idea, not yours. But God created sex with boundaries. And when sex happens within boundaries, it's awesome. When it happens outside of boundaries, it's horribly, horribly destructive. Help me out. What is the boundary or the context for which God created sex? Mary, there's the right answer. Most of you don't believe that. You know how many church kids I've had in my office for years look at me and say, but... We loved each other. <laughs> so, God did not create sex for love. That is not the boundary. God created sex for one context and one only. It's permanent, lifetime commitment. Marriage, not love. Students, I'm going to say out loud something that if someone would have come to my parochial school when I was in high school and said out loud to me, I would have thought one of two things about that person. Either they're crazy or they're old. I am both. Here comes the words. I sp I'm going to say out loud what David says in the Psalms, and I believe this with all of my heart. I love the law of God. I delight in the law of God. The law of God is like honey on my lips. I love God's law. I'll tell you why I love God's law. Two reasons. Number one is it protects. No one gets hurt. There is no disease. There is no pain. If everyone abided by the law of God, we wouldn't have trouble. Think with me about a world where I could be in a relationship with you and trust everything that came out of your mouth because no one ever lied. Think with me about a world where women weren't raped. Children weren't sexually abused. Couples didn't split up because they didn't love each other anymore and leave children abandoned. Think with me about a world where teenagers didn't bring guns onto their high school campuses and shoot their fellow students. We say, Pam, that world doesn't exist. That's not the real world. Yeah, that world does exist. It's called the kingdom of God. It's called heaven, where one day we will all, 
Abide by the law of God and there will be no pain. Second reason I love, first reason is it protects. Second reason I love the law of God is this. It's simple. It's not complicated. Even the stupidest of you in here can get this. You might be able to try to say a lot of things to God someday, but you will never be able to say, well, God, it was so hard I didn't understand if you would have been a little clearer. Especially when it comes to sex. This is not hard. Either you're married or you're not. Okay? This isn't too hard. Are you married? Did you have to think about that for more than a few seconds? Easiest question you've been asked all day, right? Are you married? No? Anybody planning to get married Saturday, November the 6th? We always have a few freshman boys in the back that have to go, that's me. I'm getting married. All right, pretend with me. Pretend with me that this Saturday, November the 6th, is your wedding day. It's this week. I got news for you. Today, Thursday, the 4th of November, listen, you are not married. Saturday, walk the aisle, say the words, exchange the rings, leave and have at it. But today, <laughs> you're not married. Anybody in here confused? Not sure whether you're married or not? Just kind of confused? Because uh, we'd be glad to help you. Okay? Here is the rule. Here is the simple law of God. If you are not married, don't do it. If you are married, go for it with the person you're married to. Okay, I have to put that in there. Some of you get a little confused. This is not hard. I mean, you're not out on a date on Friday night going, I don't know, does he like me? He said it. He's really cute. My heart's pounding. The other guy said he loved me. What is it? Was it real? What should I do? Are you married? No, then don't. If you forget everything that I tell you today, and you can only remember one thing from me, this is what I want you to hear today. If you have sex outside of the sacrament of marriage, if you have sex outside of one monogamous, and monogamy does not mean one at a time, <laughs> one partner who has only been with you, if you have sex outside of that context, you'll pay. There's a cost. No one has ever broken the law of God. No one has ever shaken their fist in his face and told them they could do it their way and didn't need his law and not paid. The question is, it's got to be, what is the cost? And is it worth paying? We're going to talk about the physical and the emotional cost today. Physical cost, help me out today. What are most teens who are having sex afraid of? What's their biggest fear? Pregnancy, Pregnancy is the biggest fear of teens having sex today. Doesn't make a bit of sense to me. I got a news flash for you. Pregnancy is not a disease. It's survivable. You can live through it. I've lived through it three times now. A few extra pounds here and there. It hasn't killed me yet. I'd have girls in my office for pregnancy tests, scared to death, waiting for the results of that test. I walk in, look at this girl, and say, your test is negative. She gets this look of relief over her face like, I am off the hook, not pregnant. Thank you very much. Let me out of your office. Wait a minute. Have you been tested for syphilis, gonorrhea, herpes, chlamydia, trichinomas, vulvodymia, arthritis, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HPV, HIV? Have you been tested for this? Me? <laughs> you know, I live in Mission Hills. I mean, wh why would I need to be tested for that? This girl is in my office thinking that she could possibly be pregnant and she doesn't think she could have a disease. Students, you have a four times greater risk of contracting a disease today than you ever have of being pregnant. Pregnant teen girls, pregnant teenage girls in this country today are carrying on average 2.3 sexually transmitted diseases. Not one, not two, most of them three or more. But they weren't worried about disease. They didn't want to get pregnant. Every school I'm in, without exception, I will have a girl write me, email me, or come right up to me and say this. Well, my mom found out I was having sex, and so she put me on the pill. Or Norplant, or Depo, fill in the blank. What's that protecting that girl from? It's birth control protects you from. <coughs> Pregnancy. That drug, that hormone that this girl is taking has just made her ten times more likely to contract the disease than if she were not taking that drug. This girl's going to end up sterile or dead. Thanks, Mom. Glad you cared. Pregnancy is not the worst thing that could happen if you decide to have sex. Far worse things than that. However, over nine years, I had to tell a lot of girls that their test was positive. Immediately, they wanted an easy, painless way out of this pregnancy they didn't plan. I have to look at this girl and say, guess what? Your choices at this point are bad, terrible, and even worse. Those are your options. You had a good choice. That was before sex. Now, all of the choices you got are going to carry consequences. Abortion is painful. I've counseled hundreds of women, 5, 10, 15 years after an abortion, still hurting. 
I've counseled teen girls with anorexia, bulimia, depression, and suicide because of an abortion I couldn't take back. So last summer I had to deal with a 20-year-old girl, the most painful things I've ever seen and witnessed. When I underwent an abortion at 18 weeks, dilation and an evacuation, the abortionist dilated the cervix, entered her uterus with a very sharp instrument that looks a little bit like pliers or tongs and literally ripped the child out in pieces. In the process of performing this procedure, he perforated her uterus, grabbed a hold of part of her bowel and yanked it right through her vagina. She was hemorrhaging. In order to stop the bleeding, they rushed her to an emergency room where they did a radical hysterectomy. This 20-year-old will never have children. Not only that, they had to do a colostomy. She's going to go to the bathroom in a bag on the outside of her body for the rest of her life. A safe, legal, little fix to a problem. No way. Abortion hurts women. Parenting is not easy. Just last May, I had a seventh grader at a middle school I spoke at, 12 years old, pregnant with twins, delivered in July. It's going to be a lot of difficult years. 80% of teenage girls who choose to parent children while they're teens will live below the poverty level for at least 10 years, most of them for the rest of their lives, and 90% will never attend or graduate from college. 90%. And 10 out of 10 of those girls sat in my office and said, not me. Well, well Pam, I'm going to finish high school, work full time, go to college, be a doctor. Life happens to most of these girls. The number one indicator of poverty in this nation, students, has nothing to do with race or where you live. The number one indicator of poverty in our country today is single parent households in the age of that young girl when she began parenting alone. Serious responsibility, girls. Guys, in case you've all fallen asleep now because we're talking about pregnancy and this does not involve you. Young men, you get a girl pregnant in the lovely state of California or any other state in this nation whom you are not legally married to. Not who you like a whole lot, okay? But a girl who you're not married to. Guys, you need to understand that you have absolutely no legal right to the choice she makes. This girl can do whatever she wants. You have no say. And suing her for stealing your sperm might prove a bit difficult. <laughs> Try. If, however, guys, this girl decides to parent your child, you now have legal responsibility. It's costing us about $30 billion a year to support teenage girls parenting their children. We can't pay this bill. Over the last few years, we've undergone welfare reform. Guys, the laws have all changed. I don't care what your cousin, your uncle, your nephew got away with. It's not happening for you. We are now requiring in all 50 states the social security numbers of both parents on every birth certificate of every child born in this country. Girls will no longer be allowed to say, I don't know who the dad is. I don't feel like naming him. We will have your social security number on the birth certificate. Guys, if you are named as the father of a child, you'll be notified by your county. The county's going to send you a little note saying you've been named as the father of this child, born to this girl, on this day. You will have between 60 and 120 days to show up at your county and say it's not me. You see, pulled my name out of a hat. I do not know that girl. That is not my kid. They'll do a blood test. If the blood test, in fact, proves that you are not the biological father, they're going to go back to mom and say, sorry, try again. So we have somebody's social security number on that birth certificate. Why do we change the law, guys? Why do we want that number? So we can let you know when your kid starts kindergarten? Send you a nice little note? Money is what we're after, guys. It's going to cost you over the next 18 years between sixty dollars and $80,000, and your pay will be garnished. If you are not working, you will incur debt. And when and if you ever do get a job, it's coming out of your paycheck. This is a serious responsibility, young men. Better think about that before you have sex. After, if you are not married, it's too late. Key word there is marriage. If you're married, you've got all the choices in the world. If you're not, you don't. Third option a young girl has if she finds herself pregnant, which I happen to think is one of the more positive options available to girls today, but not without pain. It's going to carry consequences. It's adoption. The ability of a young girl to take the child she's carried with her for nine months and loves with everything she is, to say, I want what's best for my child, and I'm not it. And I am willing to go through this pain to give my child a family. It takes a lot of courage, a lot of maturity, and a lot of love. Two million requests for adoption will go unanswered every year in this nation. Girls, please hear this. This is primarily going to affect you. Infertility, the inability to have children of your own biologically, has risen over 500% in the last eight years, in the 90s alone. In fact, we are now spending $4 billion a year on fertility treatment, and we have had more, more multiple births 
in the 90s because of fertility drugs than in the entire history of our nation up to this day. We've got so many more couples who can't have children and no infants available. Average adoption now takes between 8 and 10 years and costs between 10 and $20,000. It takes a lot of love for a girl to give her child a family and to give that couple the privilege of being parents. 34 years ago in Michigan, a young 15-year-old became pregnant. She had a lot of difficult choices to make, maybe more so than some young girls. She was raped. Abortion was legal in the 60s for rape. But this young girl chose to give her child life and then to place that child with an adoptive family. And that child was me. My biological father is a rapist. I don't even know my nationality. But I am still a human being. And I still have value. And my life isn't worth any less than any of yours just because of the way I was conceived. And I did not deserve the death penalty because of the crime of my father. And I've listened to the rhetoric all my life. And I've listened to people say, well, every child should be wanted and planned. Well, I wouldn't have an abortion. That's, that's terrible. But, but if it were rape, well, then you're a mistake, Pam. I don't believe that. I believe that every child is wanted by someone. And I believe that God, in his mercy, had a plan for me. And I can't explain it to you. And you can't explain it to me. And I've asked all the hard questions. Don't think I haven't. Did God plan me? Did God plan rape? Because I don't know if I'd serve a God that did that. Did God look down that night in November of 1964 and say, oops, what am I going to do with that? I don't know. But let me tell you something I do know, students. I know that my God is so awesome and so amazing that he is capable of taking your worst pain, whether it was something that you chose or whether it was something that was done to you. And my God can make something very beautiful come from that. It's called amazing grace. The ability of God to take even the pain in our lives, the ashes of our lives, and make something good come from that. I don't know how and I don't know why. I just know we can I've not met my birth mom someday, I hope to. If I don't meet her here on earth, I'm going to meet her in heaven. I've been praying for her since I was four years old. And when we meet, I'm going to wrap my arms around her and I'm going to tell her I love her because she loved me. Loved me enough to give me my life and then loved me enough to give me the next most special gift I was ever given, and that's my family. Since I wouldn't want any of you sitting in this room to ever have to make a choice like this, I've spent nine years of my life walking girls through these choices. There is no easy way out. The best choice is before you have sex. After that, it's going to get really tough. But please hear me today. If you, someone you care about, were to find yourself pregnant you didn't intend to be, please get some help. Please don't walk through this alone. Crisis Pregnancy Center should be close to you. Where you can find it, the best way to do that is to look under your yellow pages, under abortion alternatives, or pregnancy counseling. Look under the listings, find out who is doing the counseling, give them a call, and get some help. Don't walk through this alone. Pregnancy is survivable, though. We can live through that. I could walk you through that. That is not the worst thing that could happen if you decide to have sex today. Far worse things than that. Today, November 4th, today, in the next 24 hours, 12,000 teens will contract a sexually transmitted disease. Today, 12,000 more tomorrow. 12,000 teens who got up this morning and said, like some of you sitting in this room, that's not going to happen to me. Pam, that happens in Los Angeles and San Diego and San Francisco and Sacramento and scary schools like St. Paul, but we're okay here at Alamany. <laughs> it doesn't happen here. You're wrong. Since in the 1950s, we had five sexually transmitted diseases we knew about were treating. Five! You could count them on one hand. Go find a grandparent. Go find someone who grew up in the 40s and 50s. Ask them. Were there STDs when you were a kid? I mean, did people have them? Talk about a school, have classes, have wellness day? Oh, oh, yeah, sure. We, there were sexually transmitted diseases. Got a shot of penicillin, moved on. It's a new world. Today, we've got over 30 sexually transmitted diseases. 30% of them absolutely incurable. That means you get one of these diseases, and you've got it for life. Which is a lovely thing, guys, when you're getting ready to get married. Found this girl you love. I mean, this is it. She's the one you want to spend your life with, all those other girls. That was just messing around. This is the real thing. Pull out that diamond, look her in the eyes. If you're really cool, young men, you'll get on your knees. And you say, marry me. By the way, I've got genital warts. 
You'll get it too. And we'll both be treated for the rest of our lives. In fact, you'll probably end up with a radical hysterectomy, cervical cancer, and possibly death. But marry me. Well, I'm excited now. Thank you for sharing. Isn't that what you want to tell your spouse? Lovely. HPV, genital warts, syphilis, gonorrhea, herpes, chlamydia, trichinomas, vulvodemia, arthritis, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV, the list goes on and on and on. These are serious diseases, students, with serious consequences. Please hear me this morning. AIDS is not the only disease out there, and it is certainly not the only disease that's killing people. And yet we still have teens who actually think, well, if I don't get pregnant or I don't get AIDS, well, then I don't have anything to worry about. No way. No way. I was, uh speaking in Ohio and got about 185 emails in September from a uh, bunch of people telling me I needed to watch ABC. Because ABC was going to do a little special about sex, and we all know what a fountain of truth the media is. And I thought, well, be, before I bash ABC about their little program, I should probably watch it. If you caught this show, they, they called their little educational program Sex with Cindy Crawford. <laughs> Hour-long little program to educate us all. All right, ABC, you got an hour, 60 minutes, minus a few commercials. You will mention, I'm not even asking you to explain, okay? Mention one other disease besides AIDS. Did they? Yeah. There wasn't a word. What a tragedy for women. I could not believe it. Chlamydia, one of the most common diseases among teens today, is chlamydia. This is a bacteria, not a virus, easily treated and cured. Two classes of sexually transmitted disease. If you haven't had biology yet, this will help you. Okay, two types of STDs, bacterial and viral. A bacterial disease is curable. If we knew you had it, we could help you. Antibiotics can wipe that out. A virus is not. You get a virus, you've got it for life, there is no cure. We have never in the history of the world cured a virus, okay? Chlamydia is not a virus, it's a bacteria, curable. So what's the big deal? I'll tell you what the big deal is. And over 90% of teenagers who have chlamydia, there are no symptoms. You can't treat a disease you don't know you have. We got all kinds of teenagers out there having sex going, well, it's not bothering me. <laughs> I mean, I've had sex, but I don't have a disease. Never been tested, certainly not in the last two months, but I know I don't. How in the world would you know that? <laughs> Let me tell you something pretty safe to say I know about you. If you're sitting in this room and you are sexually active or have had sex, let me tell you something pretty safe to say I know about you. It's true of teens all over the world. You actually believe that if you get up the next morning and herpes isn't tattooed to your forehead, you don't have a disease. I mean, if I can't see it, feel it, or touch it, I don't have it. If I had a disease, if I had a disease, I would know. My nose would turn purple, my ears would be red, something would burn. I would know. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. If I asked you what the pregnancy rate was at your high school, you could probably tell me. We had eight girls get pregnant last year. There were seven girls at our school. We've got the highest pregnancy rate. But I don't know anybody at my high school who's got a disease. Really? First of all, your friends aren't getting tested. And even if they were, do you think they would tell you? <laughs> Went to the doctor Monday, found out I had herpes. Tell everybody by fifth hour. <laughs> I would like for the entire school to know. You think I'm going to tell you? There's no way. So you think walking down the halls, you're going to see it? Oh, purple nose, herpes, stay away from that. <laughs> I'm going to do that. So you think as you can't see it, feel it, or touch it, or know, any know anyone with it, it doesn't happen. It doesn't work that way. The American Medical Association released a bulletin about a year ago. They said this, every teenage girl who has had sex or is sexually active has to be tested for chlamydia every six months. Every teenage girl who has had sex has got to be tested for chlamydia every six months. Cindy Crawford didn't have a few seconds to mention that? Couldn't fit that into her little schedule? Why did the AMA say girls? Why didn't they say every teenager having sex should be tested for chlamydia? Don't guys get this? Of course they do. Who in the world do you think you're getting it from, girl? Guys and girls both get this, so why would they say just girls? I'll tell you. Girls, listen up. Girls, you contract chlamydia one time in your lifetime, cured or not, and there's a 25% chance you will be sterile for the rest of your life. Contract this disease twice, girls, it jumps to 50%. Contract it three times, and there's a really good chance you will never have children. We've got women in their 20s, early 30s saying, I'd like to start my family now. I'm married, like to have a child. They try. Can't get pregnant. They go running to an infertility specialist. He checks and says, my goodness, you've got all this scar tissue in your fallopian tubes, your ovaries, your uterus. You have pelvic inflammatory disease, PID. You had chlamydia or gonorrhea. What? What in the world did I have? How, how could I have had that disease? I didn't even know. It's too late, girls. Girls, I'm begging you to hear this this morning. 
Please hear me. That guy can break up with you, leave you, meet another girl, marry her, and have a family. This is not going to hurt him. You're scarred for life. You have more to lose, girls. Please don't miss this. I am so sorry. Life is not fair. There is no even score here. Girls, you are going to pay a higher price physically every single time. In case you miss this in sixth grade human reproduction and anatomy, we're different. Boys and girls' bodies are not the same. Some of you are looking confused. That's scaring me. <laughs> thought that was safe, I know. Girls, girls, you all have an open sexual system. The guys sitting in this room all have closed sexual systems. Girls, you are easier to infect and easier to damage on a permanent basis. It's the way you're made. Girls, you have to release an egg from an ovary. It has to make its way through a fallopian tube that cannot be scarred in any way. If that takes place and conception takes place, it's a conceived egg. Now it's to attach itself to your uterine wall. There can be no infection or scarring of a uterus. If it's able to receive the nutrients it needs, baby girls, for nine months, you deliver. He produces sperm. <laughs> Big deal. Not that hard. <laughs> Girls, your system is just a little more complicated. It's the way you're made. Now the guys are ticked. I can see you. <laughs> well, that's tough. Well, well, if you think that's so easy, you just try that then. See, they let a woman speaker come in and talk about sex, and she's just dissing men. What's wrong with you? Some kind of feminazi or something? Don't you like men? <laughs> I like men. I married one. I have two boys. And I'm going to say something really nice about a lot of the young men sitting in this room so I don't want any guys with selective hearing. Okay, you got to pay attention to the whole thing, not just a little part. Girls, I've traveled this country. I've been in towns, cities, and schools all over this nation and around the world. And girls, in every school I've been in, and Alamania is no different, sitting in this room are young men of integrity, guys with character, girls, guys who do care about you. Girls, the kind of guy, if you were to date him, would look at you and say, I do love you, and you matter. And you know what? I might be able to walk away from sex with you without permanent damage, but you might not. And I love you so much. You matter so much that I would never ask you to put your life on the line to meet my momentary needs. I would never pressure, demand sex, dump you if you wouldn't sleep with me. I care too much for you for that. There are guys with that kind of integrity, girls. I married one. Unfortunately, as a small word of warning... There are some guys who don't care. As long as they don't get hurt in the long run, they're going to say all the words. I love you. <laughs> well, everybody else is doing I can't live with it. If you won't, she will. I'll die. <laughs> You're not going to die. Nothing will fall off. You will live. <laughs> Real love respects. <laughs> love doesn't pressure, damage, hurt, take, and walk. It's not love. That's selfishness. Kids ask me everywhere I go, well, Pam, how do I know if it's love? How do I know if this person loves me? They said it. My heart's pounding. They're really, I mean, how would I know if it's really love? There's only one way you will ever know if it's love. Put a boundary down. Say this far and no further and watch for respect. Don't give love without respect. Not possible. Problem is, where do y'all get your idea about what love is? In television, movies, 90210, Dawson's Creek, Felicity, the Titanic. <laughs> My daughter begged me to take her to that flick. I made the mistake and did. Had to debrief her for two hours. One of the most abusive relationships I've seen on a screen. A young girl about ready to jump off the back of a boat. Now, I'm not the best psychologist to ever walked the face of the earth, but my guess is she was a little vulnerable. You think? Hurting a little self-esteem, probably not where it needed to be. Very nice-looking young man. Very cute. Walked into her life, said all the right words, and within 48 hours was sleeping with her, and we called it love. All I can say is it's a good thing that boy died. Because if he hadn't... We would have found out what that was all about when we hit shore. Thank you. It was fun. See ya. <laughs> Students, hear what God says love is. Love is patient. It's kind. It's not rude. It's not selfish. It would never damage someone and hurt them. It's not love. It's selfishness. I was speaking for the Diocese of Covington, Kentucky. We had about four Catholic high schools bust into an auditorium, everybody at once. I was in the back of this auditorium in Covington, and about eight girls from one of the schools got around me. Girls do things in packs. And these eight girls got around me, and they said, Pam, you know that thing you said today? You said there were guys with integrity, with character, who wouldn't pressure us for sex, who wouldn't dump us if we wouldn't sleep with them. Well, you've not been to our school. There's not a guy at our school like that. All they want is sex, and if you won't sleep with them, you'll be dateless. I said, girls, you're wrong. That is absolutely not true. There are guys at your school who, if you put a boundary down, would respect you. In 
unison, these girls looked at me and said this. Well, well then why do we always date such losers? Try to speak the truth in love. I work hard at that. Girls, take a look in the mirror. What are you settling for, girls? Girls, you want respect? You have to demand it. You want to get used, walked all over, be the next notch on someone's belt? I got a little word of advice for you today. Start in here and get used to it. You're going to get used for the rest of your life. You want respect, you have to demand it. You demand respect, you get it. Girls, I'm saying this to you, please hear my heart today. Because if you do not, you will pay the higher price. The score is not even. Then there's herpes. I spent a lot of time on herpes. Let me just say this, herpes is a virus. One of the more common diseases among, uh, uh, among young people and adults in our country today. Herpes is a virus, what does that mean? You get it, you got it for life. You'll give it to your spouse someday. There is no cure, okay? It's forever. Basically, it's sores on your genital area that reoccur on occasion throughout your life. We used to think it was, you know, that, that was no big deal. Actually, it's so, so common now that we have to endure commercials. And I'm watching television with my children. It's very nice, beautiful girl. I think she's riding a bike. And also, she, I have genital herpes. <laughs> If you have genital herpes, you can take this medication. It may cause diarrhea, vomiting, and nausea. <laughs> and I'm thinking, whatever that is, I want that. So nice, you know? <laughs> Students, everybody, of, of all people over the age of 12 in this nation, one out of five, one out of five of everyone over the age of 12 is infected with herpes today, a virus. You don't get to say, oops, wish I wouldn't have that. It is for life. That's not the number one STD, though. The number one sexually transmitted disease in this country and around the world is human papilloma virus, HPV. This is a virus. What does that mean? You get it. You got it for life. No cure. You will give it to everyone you have sex with after infection. This is not only the most common virus, this is the most contagious. Not transmitted the same way as HIV. We'll talk about that in a minute. Street name for HPV is genital warts. Basically, warts on your genital area that need to be burned off periodically, either through laser surgery or chemical. We used to think that was the only big deal. It's kind of gross. Have to have some warts burned off now and then. Until we realized a few things about this. Number one is this. You can have this virus, and you can be giving it to other people without ever having warts. In fact, the most cancerous strains of this virus don't produce warts at all. Girls. If you do get warts or lesions as a result of being infected with this virus, typically girls, they will be on your cervix. When was the last time you saw your cervix? I had an eighth grade boy in Detroit look up at me and go, I don't know. <laughs> Said, you don't have one, honey, breathe. <laughs> girls, this is not a part of your body. You can see, okay? I know. And when I say genital warts at a high school, I know I've got students sitting in this room who've had sex who in your mind are going to do this. Well, she said that wart thing, and I have never seen a wart down there. I don't have that. If you have not been specifically tested by a physician for the virus, and hear me very carefully, to be tested for the virus is a very expensive blood test that is almost never done, certainly never done at free clinics. So we got all kinds of kids going, well, I got tested. I went down to the free clinic, paid $5, and I don't have anything. Absolutely not. They, we can't t afford to test you for the virus. What we do is require all women who've had sex to undergo a pap smear yearly, at, at least, if not every six months, to fact make sure that you don't get the eventual result of the virus, the possible result of the virus, which is cervical cancer. Guys, this is, uh, HPV is kind of annoying and Having warts burned off your genital area on occasion is painful. I'm sure, I'm guessing, I don't know, I'm, but I think it probably would be. In. And I would hate to have to be there when you had to tell the girl you loved and want to marry that you were going to give this to her. That, that won't be any fun. But you're going to live. Girls, this is a big deal for you. HPV is the number one cause of lesion of cervical cancer in women. We've got young girls as young as 18, 19, and 20 undergoing radical hysterectomies because of cervical cancer. Dealt with a senior last year. Came up to me, was being real tough. Oh, yeah, I have HPV. I have cervical cancer. I've had numerous cryosurgeries on my cervix. It's been frozen numerous times and the cancer now spread to the uterus and I'm getting a hysterectomy in three weeks just before she graduated from high school. She said, Pam, it doesn't matter. Kids are noisy, smelly, and they cost a lot of money and I don't want any. Then she got a little teary. She said, I'm just trying to deal with the fact that I'm going to have to tell the man that I love and want to marry that if he marries me, neither will he. It's it worth it, girls? Girls, do you realize that more women died in this country in 1997 of cancer-related illness due to this disease than died of AIDS? 
This STD is killing more women currently than is HIV. Second leading cause of cancer death in women. And we're not talking about this? Not telling our daughters this? I had a 10th grader stop me after an assembly in tears. She said, Pam, three months ago, went to a party, got drunk. Girls, can I love you just a minute? You can have all the right answers today. No, I want respect. I don't want scarred tubes. I don't want cancer. I, I don't want all that. I wa I'm going to wait. And then one night you get drunk and have no concept what it is you're doing. Please don't drink. Please don't use any kind of drug that would alter your ability to choose. This girl had been drunk. She had sex with this guy. Now she's scared. What do I do? I said, you need to get tested. Do it today. Please go to your family physician, use your insurance, and ask to be tested for everything. Please do that. She called my hotel that night in tears. She said, Pam, I have HPV. Visible warts on the cervix. They didn't even need to wait for a blood test. For life. She's going to give this virus to everyone she has sex with from this point on. Who knows what it means, her ability to have children, cancer, we don't know. And in tears, she said this. Well, why didn't you come to my school three months ago? Nobody told me this. Didn't know. Hung up the phone, sat alone that night, and thought, would she have heard me? Think she would have listened? Or would she have sat like hundreds of teens and still found a way to say, it's not going to happen to me? Students, you're not playing the same game I was playing. Not playing the same game your parents were playing. Good morning, it's not 1974. Computer graduated from high school in 1967. Maybe we have some staff here who can remember that year. Computer graduated in 67. One in 32 of your classmates would have had a sexually transmitted disease. You would have had to have had a few partners. Computer graduated with me in the dark ages of 1983. One in 18 of my classmates had a sexually transmitted disease. In 1996, it was one in four. What are the chances now that you could have sex with someone who has been with someone before you, is not a virgin, and not get a disease? Not good. And we're talking about this virus, not the other 29 diseases. Just one virus. They now estimate that 47% of sexually active singles, that's a specific group, that is not everyone in this room, 47% of the teens who have already had sex are already infected with this virus. It's one out of two, and there is not a condom in the world that will protect you from this. This is not a disease of blood and semen. This does not necessarily take the exchange of body fluids for you to be infected, students. This is a disease of the entire genital area. All it takes is skin contact anywhere in the genital area, and you're infected for life and will infect everyone you have genital contact with after that. Let me make this really clear today. It doesn't take sex. You know how many girls I've had in my office test positive for both herpes and HPV who were technically virgin? Thought they could do everything else. See what was their big fear? What are they worried about? Worried about getting pregnant. So I can do all this other stuff. It's not really sex, Pam. I won't have to worry, really. Number one question I get everywhere I go around the world. Number one question I get from teens is this. Well, how far is too far? Well, then, Pam, where's the line? Well, then just lay it out. What can we do and not get a disease? And I was convinced for five years, absolutely convinced that this was a teenage problem. It's teenagers. I don't know what we have to say to these kids. They don't get it. They so narrowly define sex that sex is only the penis actually entering the vagina. Nothing else is sex. And then I realized the president of the United States doesn't know how to define sex. And <laughs> I'm having a bit of trouble figuring out why you can't get it. Wasn't really sex. That doesn't count, does it? Let me give you the medical line over which you can't step. If you have stepped over this line, you have risk disease and you need to get tested. I don't think this is complicated. I don't think this is tough. I think you can understand this. Here it is. Absolutely no genital contact of any kind. None. You stepped over that and you're at risk. I'd have girls in my office daily for pregnancy tests, scared to death. I'd do the test. I'd walk in, look at that girl, and say the test is negative. She would be like, thank you, I'm gone. I'm leaving. No, you're not. You need a pap smear, a blood test, vaginal culture, physicians in Tuesday, Thursday, Friday when you come in. Oh, not me. I don't need those tests. Yeah, you do. Well, no, see, Pam, I've only been with my boyfriend, and he has only been with me. Well, that's good. How do you know that? He told me. It's good. Did you ask the right question? Students, please realize this. It is never good enough to ask a partner if they've had sex before. 
That is not good enough information. You have got to know whether on any occasion that person has ever had genital contact with anyone else besides you. If they have, you're at risk and you need to get tested. Is that clear? Anybody confused? Because I don't want you confused about that. Then there's HIV. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this virus. I'm going to remind you this. HIV is a virus that causes AIDS. It's deadly. You don't want it. This is an equal opportunity virus hurting the guys as much as it is the girls. In light of that, what have you been told to do to make sure you don't get this particular disease that will kill you? If I said safe sex to you, what would some of you say? Kind of. Hey, sure, fam. I don't have to worry about disease. I can sleep with 18 people. I got a piece of latex. <laughs> safe. Unbelievable. Students, the only safe sex is a safe partner. Someone who has never had sex, or if they have, hear me very carefully, it has been at least three years from the last time they had sex of complete abstinence. Please have them tested with their blood viral testing to make sure, in fact, that they are not carrying a disease. That is the only way you will ever know that you won't get a disease. And saying no to sex won't hurt you. Once you've said yes, you've lost all guarantees. I was speaking in a state... Middle, in the Midwest, got a call middle of the week from a superintendent in western New York. He said, Pam, we've got a tragedy. We need you to get to our school this month. I said, I'm booked through the end of this year and next. I will put you on a waiting list. I get cancellations. You're at the top of my list. Hung up, thought I'd taken care of that. Two hours later, the middle school principal called. He said, Pam, I know you've already told my superintendent that you won't come to our school, but our school's a morgue. I can't be on a waiting list. I can't wait till next spring. Please rearrange your schedule. Three weeks later, I flew to Jamestown, New York. Three weeks before I got there, nine seventh and eighth grade girls tested positive for HIV. They were all infected by the same young man, a 19-year-old by the name of Nushan Williams. When they found out nine of their seventh and eighth graders were positive, they tested 70 students in that district who had either had sex with that guy or with one of those nine girls. By the time I got there, they tested 500 teens in the county. It will be years before we know who's dying and who's not. I got done speaking at the middle school, and all the other 7th and 8th graders went back to class, and one little 8th grade girl, blonde, blue-eyed little girl, I will never forget her, waited till everybody else had left so she could talk to me alone. Just turning 14, just found out she was HIV positive. This 8th grader looked at me that morning, and she said, Pam, how could he do that to me? He loved me. He loved her, you think? That's love now. Sex is love, and love is sex. If you love me, you will prove it. That's love now. Please tell me we haven't fallen that far. Sex isn't love, and love isn't sex. Let me tell you something about this little eighth grader, though, because she's not that different from some of you. She so desperately wanted somebody to love her, anybody. Someone to say, you're pretty, you matter, I like you. She was willing to put her life on the line to get love. And she actually believed that if she gave sex to this guy, she'd get loved. What she got was used. It's not the same thing. What if we didn't have AIDS? What if we didn't have genital warts and herpes and chlamydia and syphilis and gonorrhea? What if I could give you a super condom? I mean, I can't. But what if we could? Use it, sleep with 20 people, it won't matter. Are there other reasons besides disease that we might want to wait? I think so. See, I'm stupid enough to think that sex is a, more than a biological act to meet a biological need. More than a hormone you can't control and it you've got to scratch. It involves more than just your physical body. It involves everything you are. God called it a one flesh experience. The taking of two unique individuals and bonding them for life. 1 Corinthians 6, 18. These are God's words and not mine. Please hear them. Flee sexual immorality. Run in the other direction. All other sins you could commit. That is astounding, students. Murder, lying, cheating, stealing. Any other sin you could commit is outside your body, but he or she who sins sexually sins against your own body. Basically damages everything you are. That's why this is so devastating. I was on a plane heading to Cincinnati. This is typical airplane conversation. This nicely dressed businessman looks over at me, sits down, and goes, Oh, going to Cincinnati, what do you do? I'm a speaker. Cool, who do you speak to? Junior high, high school, college kid? Ah, oh, cool, what do you speak about? Sex. He'll either go back to his reading material real fast or decide to talk to you. This guy thought that was interesting, so he said, what do you tell teens about sex today? So you tell them to wait. Not to have sex until they're married. One partner for life. By now, the entire plane is listening, and this guy looks over at me and goes, what? Are you crazy? They're all doing it. They're out of control. They're animals. I mean, what is the success rate of telling teens not to have sex. Before I tell you what I said to this lovely gentleman on an airplane, can I apologize you, to you? Please allow me to sincerely apologize to you for any adult who would walk into your life and tell you you can't control this. That it's hormones. You're no better than the family pet. 
that you're going to turn 14 or 15 and the hormones are going to kick in and you're going to be walking school halls going, <laughs> it's not going to matter. It's hormones. They can't possibly control it. You're better than that. You can say yes. And you can say no. It's a choice. You choose. This astounds me. Girls especially are bad at this. They'll come up to me and I'll go, well, Pam, I, I was going to wait and I really didn't mean to have sex with those eight guys, but it just happened. <laughs> My favorite one is this one. It was an accident. <laughs> what, were you walking to get your mail naked and some guy was jogging by and he was naked? <clears throat> that would be an accident. <laughs> this is not an accident. This did not just happen. You chose. You can say yes, and you can say no, okay? First thing I said to this guy, back to the plane, first thing I said to this guy was this, buddy, everybody's not doing it. That's a lie. Thousands of students all over the nation are choosing to say no to sex until marriage. I stood in the dome in Atlanta with 40,000 students and over a million commitment cards signed by teens across this nation saying, believing that true love waits. I make a commitment to God, myself, my family, those I date, my future spouse, and my future children to remain sexually pure from this day on until I enter a sacramental marriage relationship. We stack those cards from the floor of the dome through the roof twice. There are thousands of teens who aren't having sex. How unfair that we would say everybody's doing it. Not true. Second thing I said to this businessman on the plane was this. Buddy, I don't care how old you are or how old I am. Your yes to sex and mine doesn't mean a darn thing if we don't know how to say no. Anybody can say yes. It takes no talent or ability. It takes character, integrity, and self-respect to say no. Students, I sat where you're sitting. I went to parochial school. I had parents who loved me a lot, parents who told me what God said about sex. They said, Pam, God says don't have sex, don't do it. School said that too. This was the extent of my sex education. God said don't do it, don't do it, end of discussion. And actually, that should be enough. Should be enough. You know, in all my discussions, and all my thoughts about sex outside of marriage before I got married, I thought this, and I missed a piece, and I want to give this piece to you. See, I thought that I'd have to say no to sex until I was married. It would be so hard, take 185,000 cold showers, beat people up with sticks, and then someday I would get married, and I would never struggle with sexual temptation again. It would be over. See, because married people don't struggle. Once you put this wedding ring on, there is no temptation. Marriage is happily ever after, excitement, heart-pounding romance, all the time. There's never a moment that I look over at my husband and go, I married that? <laughs> and, and, and I am just so beautiful and gorgeous, there will never be a woman more attractive than me. Not for 50 years, ever. Really, you think so? Come on, marriage is work. Marriage is tough. Marriage requires sacrifice and it requires integrity. What in the world, adults? What in the world made us think in the 70s and 80s that we could sleep with whoever we wanted? No big deal. Sex was free. Sleep around. And then someday we'd put a white dress on, a white tux on, and the magic discipline fairy would sprinkle dust on us. And now we would be able to control what we never controlled back there. Did it work? No. And many of you sitting in this room have experienced the pain of infidelity and adultery. You've watched families be ripped apart because someone didn't have control. I was speaking at a parochial school and a senior waited till no one saw him speaking to the sex speaker after school when he was pretty sure it was safe. He said, Pam, I want to talk to you. You scared me to death today. So what's the deal? He said, first of all, I want you to know I'm a senior. I've been dating this girl for two years. I love her. She's awesome, perfect, beautiful. I'm going to marry her. She's everything I ever wanted. One of the reasons he told me he was going to marry her is she wouldn't sleep with him. She had integrity. That was important to him and the girl he married. I said, you said I scared you, buddy. What's the deal? He said, well, just before school started this fall, my buddy and I were over on this college campus. We were there for college days. We were hanging out in the dorms that weekend, and this college freshman, she threw herself at me. <laughs> what was I supposed to do? I regretted it. I wish I hadn't done a swept her under the carpet until you came to my school. He said, Pam, I'm going to get tested. I'll do it this week. I promise. But I'm afraid you're going to tell me something else. I'm afraid you're going to tell me I need to tell my girlfriend what I did. Oh, yeah, you will. Yeah, but she threw herself at me. <laughs> I have moms tell me, moms are good at this, you were really hard on the boys. You were just so hard on those boys, Pam. I mean, have you seen girls lately? Have you been on a high school campus lately? Yeah. Have you seen the way these girls dress? Just take me now. What is my little boy supposed to do? <laughs> Fleeing might be an option. I don't know. Running in the other direction, I'm thinking. It's tough. I don't know what you should do. I looked at this guy, the senior in high school, and I said, buddy, 
You want to go seven years down the road with me? Let, let's go seven years down the road. You've married this awesome, beautiful little girl. You've got two beautiful kids. Your job takes you on the road. I know what that's like. I'm in hotels 14 nights a month. You're tired, exhausted. You've had a long day. You just want something to eat. You get down to that restaurant bar thing, you bring a book. You're minding your own business, and some woman walks up and throws herself at you. You're going to call your wife later and say, sorry, honey, but she started it. It was not me. Is that going to fly in your house? That doesn't fly in mine. Young man, the integrity you show yourself, the discipline and control you show yourself and every girl you date is very indicative of what we can expect from you long term. What do you think, some magic was going to happen with a ceremony? Girls, the respect and integrity you show yourself and every guy you date is pretty indicative of what we can expect from you long term. It starts right here. A lot of you haven't heard you're worth waiting for here from me. The person you're going to spend your life with is worth your very best. Some of you sitting in here are thinking, well, this talk was not for me. You're just too late. Well, I, I wish I would have heard this three years ago, four years ago. I wish I'd have heard this six months ago. If you're sitting in this room and you've had sex and you've been tempted to tune me out, I need you to tune me back in. You've got the same choice to make today as everyone else in this room. I'm not really as concerned with what you chose to do before you walked in here. I am really concerned with what you cho choose to do when you walk out. And the first thing I want to say to you is that there is a God who loves you, who wants the best for you who has given us rules and standards in order to give us that best because he didn't want the pain. Let me tell you something about, else about this God. He knows that there will always be people who will do it their way. And that's why he provided his son as a sacrifice for us when we blow it. But you know what? You've got a choice to make. You can either come to God today and say, God, I'm sorry. I did it my way. I didn't understand. I want you to forgive me and I want to start over. See, repentance, my friend, is not, is not, the sacrament of reconciliation is not, I'm sorry I got caught. It is not, I feel bad because I hurt someone or I hurt myself. The sacrament of re reconciliation is calling sin, sin, saying, God, I agree with you about my behavior, and then turning 180 degrees and going in the other direction. Not, I'm sorry today, and I'm going to do it again on Monday. But I'm sorry, I am deeply hurt by what I've chosen to do. And God, I make you a promise that I'm going to turn 180 degrees. Well, how do you do that, Pam? How can you do that? It's so hard. It's such a struggle. How do you say no? The only way that I know that you can withstand this temptation. And Paul the Apostle in the Corinthians said this, There is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. We all struggle. We all struggle daily to do what's right. The only way that I know to turn 180 degrees and to begin to honor God with your choices is to be connected with the life of Christ. It's to be connected consistently, always connecting, abiding in the life of Christ. That is what sacraments are for, to continually abide in the life of Christ, to gather from that the strength we need to live righteously. One of the options is you ask for forgiveness, you walk out of here and you start over. The other option is you harden your fists in the face of God and tell him one more time you don't need his rules and you can do it your way. And you walk out of here the same as you were when you walked in. And let me give you a little promise. I know what, the, what is at the end of that road. It's death. Death is at the end of that road. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. The choice is to walk in the life of Christ or to choose death. Somebody, I had a, a young girl in Anchorage, Alaska come up to me. She said, Pam, I'm a recycled virgin. She said, cool. She said, when I was 15, I had sex. It left me with so much pain. I said, no more. I don't want to do that anymore. I asked Jesus to forgive me. And I made a commitment that I would not have sex again until I was married. I said, you know what, that's so awesome. Someday when you get married, you will have to tell that guy what you did when you were 15. But hear me very carefully. You're going to be able to look at that guy, and you're going to be able to say, for the last three years, five years, seven years, whatever it is, I have waited for you. I've practiced discipline in my life. I can be trusted. And we're going to know what kind of damage was done. We've had some years to make sure she's okay. You can walk out of here and keep doing what you've been doing. That's a choice you need to make. Or today, you can say no more. Someone's going, yeah, but Pam, you don't get it. I mean, if I went back to my boyfriend or girlfriend and told them I loved them, I love them. I don't want to break up. I want the relationship but not the sex. They'll dump me. I mean, if I won't sleep with them, they'll find somebody else. The relationship will be over. Really, what's your relationship based on? It's based on sex. Want to test a relationship that's sexual? Want to find out whether or not they love you? Do you want to know? 
I got a challenge for you today. Stop. See what's left. If they love you, they will still be around. If not, you've just learned, my friend, what you need to learn about that relationship. If you're sitting in this room and you have never had sex, you still have your virginity. And if my stats are right, that's at least half of you. If you're sitting in this room and you still have your virginity, I want to say this to you this morning. And I want to say this because I know you don't hear it very often. Please hear it from me today. Good for you. Good for you. You have something so special and so valuable. It is worth whatever it takes to get to your marriage with no past, no fear. It's not going to be easy. You're going to get laughed at. Kids are going to say to you, you're not having sex. Everybody else is doing it. I told you that God wanted to give you the best and God wanted you to have great sex and you laughed at me. This nation spent $5 million in 1996 and 97 to find out who's having the best sex in this country. University of Boston, Chicago, UCLA. Guess what every study, $5 million produced. I, this was so unbelievable. Rolling Stone magazine's freaking out. They can't believe it. Uh, Matt Lauer's chin is dropping. This can't possibly be true. Guess who's having the best sex in this nation? Christian, married, monogamous women. Yes. <laughs> you know what they're calling it? They're calling their studies Revenge of the Church Ladies. <laughs> it's hilarious. Students, can I tell you something? God loves you. God wants the best. And this morning I have set before you life and death. I cannot choose for you. No one in this room can choose for anyone else. What I'm asking you to do is to think. You deserve the best. Never settle for less than that. You deserve respect. My heart cry to you is that you would choose life. Choose life that you and your children and generations to come might live. You guys have been awesome. Thank you for your attention. God bless you. Got the girl, she was on cloud nine. He was up on top of the world. Puppy love, they would lasso the moon together. We found another girl when she had their boy. Anything for love, he said she was the only one. Nothing old and nothing new. She's all alone with baby blue. Now listen what she had to say. Not what I thought it would be. It's not supposed to happen to me. And I wish I could go back in time. I'm just 16. I don't thought it would be. Here I'm now. God's perfect time out there somewhere in the world just for you. You will last so the moon together. So will you trust the one who made the world? He invented love and made the one you're dreaming of. But from now and until then, trust and wait. It would be It's not good